I mean, that's enough to give God some praise for alone. Man, life been dragging me this week. <laughs> it's been hard, man, but God has showed me time and time again he's faithful, man. And um, we also been having to learn where we end and where God begins. A lot of times, a lot of times we're facing these situations that we want to just dive in and do things our own way. But man, God is saying, man, I know better what's going on than you do. I'm stronger than you are. I'm wiser than you are. So why don't you just trust me? I got your best interest in mind anyway, so just trust me. It might not feel good while you're going through it, but sooner or later you'll understand why we had to go through some of the things we got to go through. So I'm just glad for that reason alone, man. It's a privilege to be up here. I want to give honor to our pastor, first lady in the absence. I want to give honor to Pastor Chuck, as well as his wife, Miss Loretta. Give honor to my wife, Chanel, who's here to support me. As well as my son, Ryan. All the ministers, deacons, everyone. Just God bless y'all. And uh, I ain't going to be up here too long, man. I'm just going to be in and out. Man, God just been kind of dealing with me this week. Like I said, it's been a rough week. And uh, just going through a lot at work. And you got family things going on. You got sicknesses and illnesses, different things going on. Sometimes you just feel like you're just overwhelmed by it all. And I've been in that place, like Caleb said, that place of depression. You're in that place of anxiety. You're just trying to figure out, man, God, I know you said, you know, you're walking with me, but I kind of feel like I'm handling this kind of solo right now, you know. I'm going to need you to give me a little more strength. He said his strength is made perfect in our weakness. I, I weighed a white flag. I said, I'm weak, bro. You're going to have to pull up on me because I ain't got it right now. And um, God, I, I kind of felt convicted. God was like, Name one time you were going through a situation that I didn't come through to your help and to your aid and deliver you from whatever you were going through. Name one time when I left you abandoned or I didn't comfort you when you needed to be comforted. And what he really shared with me, man, it's really just time for us to grow up. And that's not being insensitive because life can deal you some blows, like we said. We're dealing with loss. We're dealing with tragedy. We're dealing with illness. And it's a time of mourning and a time of grief that should be taking place. But I also believe that sometimes some of the things that we go through outside of those events are things that we probably bring on to ourselves a lot of the times because God is speaking to us. He's speaking. He's speaking. But, yeah, when he's speaking, we turn the deaf ear to it and do what we want to do. Um, so the text I'm coming from today is in the book of Hebrews. It's going to be my title text, and I got a few more that I'm going to break down as we go through. But it's in the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, and I'll be reading verses 12 through 14. And we're coming from the CSB or the Christian Standard Bible. And, um, yeah, man, I, I pray it blesses you the way it blessed me. Um, it was challenging. It was extremely challenging because I didn't know I was going to preach today until about 3 o'clock yesterday. <laughs> but uh, you got to be ready in season and out of season. And um, we should always have something we can thank God for, something we can say good about the Lord at all times. Amen. So we're going to read this. When you have it, say amen. All right, and it reads, Although by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the basic principles of God's revelation again. You need milk, not solid food. Now everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the message about righteousness because he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. You may be seated. Now, for my people who are new in the faith, it's understandable. You know, you may be struggling with some of this stuff. It's a big transition. You may have been living a certain way 15, 20 years or longer, uh, living a certain way for yourself. And now you're coming into the understanding of who God is, who Jesus is, and what he did for you. You understand that you got the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, guiding you in the ways of righteousness or whatnot. And it's a, it's a contrast between the way you used to live and the way he's asking you to live now. So we understand it's a learning curve that has to take place. That's why you should have other brothers and sisters around you that are more seasoned to help you in these things. But for my seasoned saints, for my people who have been in the faith, it don't mean you're older, you could be young. But if you've been walking with God for a while now, and you've been hearing this message of the gospel over and over and over again, it ought to be some fruit being just evident from what we've heard. Amen. If you've heard this, these basic principles should be the foundation for what we have, and we should be building on that foundation. The foundation of a building is going to be at the bottom. 
And, that, and that's the fact that we were saved by Christ on the cross. He died for our sins or whatnot. But if you're looking out here now, it's other people who believe other things out here. And they sound with it. I was at a restaurant with Rosie the other day, and I talked to a guy in there and had a trap theology shirt on. He came up to me and asked me what I believe or whatnot. And um, we had a very spirited conversation um, about our beliefs or whatnot. And even though we didn't disagree, he was confident. He was bold. He was, well, look at this and look at that and look at this and look at that. And I'm like, man, how many people who are Christians who claim that we have the truth are able to defend our faith or explain what we believe beyond just he died on the cross and that's it. And it's power in that. Don't, I'm not minimizing that at all. It's power in that, but that should be the foundation. Daily we should be growing and, and learning and pursuing God wholeheartedly. So I'm looking at it, and I'm just thinking, man, if somebody came up to one of us right now and said, why do you believe in Jesus? What would we say? If they looked at our behavior, how we carry ourselves in certain times, would it, be, would it exemplify somebody who really followed Christ and said they were a believer? That's all of us. It don't matter if you're up here in, in the pew. We all have a responsibility to live a life that exemplifies our belief in Christ. And what happens is when we're immature, the scriptures are talking about, it could be a situation where you have been walking with God for a while, but you've gotten to this puffed up state to where you figure out, okay, I got it figured out now. And you start slacking on your studying, you start slacking on your prayer, you start slacking on your fasting. That's probably one of the least popular things in the church probably is fasting because we hate to tell ourselves no. But a mature person is able to tell themselves no if they know it's for the betterment of where they're trying to go. So I got an example. Imagine you at a cookout and you hungry. I'm talking about you super hungry. And you see these folks putting these big juicy steaks on the grill. They're putting chicken on the grill, shrimp, salmon, the whole nine. They pull the food off the grill. They tell everybody, okay, it's time to come eat. So when you come in the kitchen to try to eat, they're handing everybody glasses of milk. And you looking like, man, where the food at? They're like, this is the food. You're going to be upset. You could be so upset that you're probably going to leave because I didn't come for no milk. I came to a cookout. I want meat. Then why is it so cool for us to settle for milk in our spiritual lives? Why are we not so passionate about that spiritual meat as we are about this physical meat that we want to put in our belly? You got to ask yourself the question, though. Are you even ready for meat? Can you even chew the meat? You still got gums? Can you bite down? Can you sink your teeth into the meat? I remember a couple years ago, man, one of the biggest sports events of the year was the Super Bowl. And I recall a certain team from Atlanta called the Falcons. And they had a pretty, pretty, sorry, brother, I had to just, they had a pretty substantial lead. I recall the lead was 28 to 3, I believe it was. But when the pressure came on, when it was time to sink their teeth into that steak, they, 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 they choked on it because they didn't have the teeth. They, they couldn't bite down on the steak. They couldn't finish it. But see, it was a brother by the name of Tom Brady. He'd been to the steakhouse a, a few times. He, he ate steak pretty frequently. So when it came down to chew on the steak and finish the meal, he finished the meal. Are you ready for the steak if the steak is in front of you? There's so many Christians right now that are angry. We're discontent, we're frustrated, we're miserable, and we're lacking hope. And like I said earlier, life does have its share of hardships. But when we have these hardships, we shouldn't be giving up. That should make our passion to pursue Christ even more fire. We should have more fire like she was talking about a couple weeks ago. You look at these other groups like I was talking about, you see these groups, they don't even have the truth that we have, but they're showing more unity. They're showing more growth. They're showing more structure. And these also happen to be key components of what we define as maturity. As believers full of the Holy Spirit, our, shoot, our fruit should be coming forth. Maybe the cause for many of us having such a negative disposition is a lack of maturity in the things of God. Therefore, causing us to bear, to bear the rotten fruit that comes from operating in the flesh. When you're living in a carnal manner, when you're living outside the will of God, what you think going to happen? And I know God, he'll bless you. Sometimes we ain't living right, and God still come through with his grace and his mercy and say, hey, I know you're acting a fool right now, but I'm still going to do this for you. But I mean, come on, at some point, 
it has to be some maturity taking place. We get up every, every Sunday morning, we come in here and we sit here for an hour. We're going to be shorter than that today, but we come and sit here for an hour. <laughs> and we're giving our time, we're giving our energy. People getting dressed up all nice, putting makeup on, getting their hair done, doing, doing, all, doing the whole nine. And we're coming in here, but yet when we leave out of here, sometimes it's not even evident that we've even been in the building. We've been having prayer on Wednesdays. How many folks in the building can raise your hand right now and say you don't need prayer? But we got the prayer service on Wednesday. Ain't nobody here, though. But everybody's stressed out. Everybody's frustrated. Everybody has this negative disposition. Do we or do we not believe that God can save? Do we or do we not believe that he's a healer? Do we not believe the things that we sing in worship service in these songs? We see people crying, they're weeping, they, they're giving God praise and all. And I know some people just can't make it because they got things to do. So I'm not condemning you if you can't make it. But what I'm saying, even if you can't make it, even in your personal time at home, are we taking that time set apart for God and to say, you know what, I just want to have this, this, this quiet time with God right now. Let me pray real quick. Let me read my Bible. Are we giving more other things time than we're giving God in the Word of God? Most likely we are. And that's, I'm, I'm guilty as well. I sit sometimes, I sit down and watch college football all day on Saturday. And then when it comes to the things of God sometimes, I'm lazy. And I had to look at myself. That's why I said I got convicted when I looked at this. I was just like, man, you know, you're going through this, you're going through that. You want to complain, you want to gripe, you want to go through all this stuff. But then look at, look at, your, look at your habits. Look at your eating habits. I can't put this big outlaw <laughs> rear by in front of your face. You're going to choke on it. So I think sometimes, man, we need a reminder of what it means to live for God, the things that we should be doing and the things that we shouldn't be doing. And we have the tendency of trying to see things that we, we know we shouldn't be doing, but we're trying to find reasons to justify them because we feel like I don't want to be bound. I want to be free. I want to have this freedom. You don't have freedom to do whatever you want to do. You have freedom to obey God. Because it was a point where it didn't matter what you were trying to do, God wasn't feeling it. And if we were in the Old Testament, we all be outside lined up right now, and they'd be throwing rocks at us. Everybody just be. <laughs> We'd be done. So your life has been spared. So let me sit back and think, why would God spare our lives? We can just do whatever we want to do. I can go here and do this and say this and say that. That don't even really make sense. I've never seen God do anything in Scripture without having a purpose behind it. So if you have a life, that means you have a purpose. And a lot of us are struggling to find that purpose for a few reasons. Sometimes we're just not being obedient in the things that God wants us to do because it gets hard and it gets difficult, and we kind of just throw in the towel on it. Sometimes we just don't have the patience to wait for God and go through the season of preparation that he wants us to go through, and we get discontent, we get frustrated, we get angry, and we're like, God, I'm going through enough. I don't need all this right now, as if he don't know what we're going through. But I've learned the hardest moments in your life, most of the time, are preparation for the things that God wants you to do. Yeah. And he's there with you. He's comforting you. He's keeping you. But we just can't quit. And we can't fold. We have to stand firm in the things that we know. Yeah. Faith is not about what you see. It's about what you know. Yeah. So we're going to come talk about some characteristics of being immature. One of the first characteristics of immaturity is the immature person isn't looking for growth. They already consider themselves to have great wisdom. Scriptures say the wise man is the one who knows he knows nothing. But what happens with us, we get into the state of being comfortable with God. We get into the state where, ah, yeah, I heard that before, I heard that before. And we don't press in the way that we did when we first met God. When you first understood what happened, you had this zeal, you had this passion. You could go anything, do anything. You'd be out of order, but you didn't care. You just had this passion, had this zeal, this fire for God. But after a while, you get comfortable. We do that in a lot of our relationships. You get married, sometimes you get comfortable. You date somebody, sometimes you get comfortable. Somebody told me a long time ago, the thing that you had to do to get that person, the thing you're going to have to do to keep them. But with God, he came and got us. So it should be even more passion toward keep making sure he's pleased with the way that we're living. The immature person isn't saying, man, what can I do to please God? He's thinking, what can I do to please myself? I don't need no answers. I got the answers. I already know what's going on. Another characteristic of an immature person is throwing a tantrum when you don't get your way. 
this weekend we had our godson with us, little Blake. He's a good baby, actually, real quiet. Don't cry too much. He was just chilling. It came a moment we were in the car, leaving Ryan's soccer game, and he was just fussing in the car. And what he wanted was his juice cup, but the juice cup was empty. So he go to suck it on the cup, wasn't nothing in it. So he was frustrated. We took the cup away. Man, he was going off, just, ah! <laughs> and I'm sitting here thinking, because, hmm, you can't really get too mad at the baby, because we the same way. When I don't get what I want, I start throwing tantrums. I start getting frustrated. I start getting angry. And the sooner we realize this about God and not us, the better off we're going to be. Sometimes God is taking those things away from us because they're not good for us. Not for a baby just sucking on a cup full of air. That ain't going to do no good for him. But at the time, he didn't, he didn't want to understand that. He a baby, he can't understand it. When you're immature, you don't understand the things of God like that. When you become more seasoned, you begin to understand how God functions because you have a relationship. When you don't have that relationship, the things of God will become foreign to you at all times. Sometimes he don't reveal stuff to you, but some of the stuff is right here in the scripture. He's saying, this is how I move. This is my heart. This is how I feel about certain things. Do these things, and so A, B, and C is going to happen. But when you're acting like a baby and you're throwing a tantrum, he didn't want to hear nothing we had to say. It wasn't nothing we could have did until we put that juice cup back in his hand. And that's how we are. Until we get what we want in our hand, we're going to act the fool. We're going to come to church. We're going to be in a bad mood. We're going to be rude. We're going to be talking about folks. We're going to be negative. We're going to do all these things that if God hasn't blessed us or if God doesn't understand what we're going through. So we're going to break some of these things down in detail. And we're going to do this from the message version of the Bible because I feel like it brought it home in a way only the message version can. We're going to go to Galatians chapter 5. Very familiar passage. Um, and we're going to look at verses 19 through 21 first. And this right here, man, psh, we can't see ourselves in this. It's just like what I was talking about earlier. It's that immature person that doesn't think they need growth. They think they have the answers. If we can read through this and you feel like none of this is you, hey, God bless you. Let me know y'all got it. Y'all ready? Hmm. It is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Immature. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex. A stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. Frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness. Trinket or fake gods. Magic show religion. Paranoid loneliness. Cutthroat competition. All-consuming yet never satisfied once. A brutal temper. An impotence to love or be loved. Divided homes and divided lives. Small-minded and lopsided pursuits. A vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival. Uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions. Ugly parodies of community. I could go on. This isn't the first time I have warned you. You know. If you use your freedom this way, you will not inherit God's kingdom. That right there, that was just, he just came out the gate. He just punched everybody in the mouth. I'm just like, man. But we hear these things, whatnot, and sometimes we like, well, well, we ask these questions, knowing it's wrong. Well, what if I do this? Or what about this? So what I want to do is I want to take a few of these that I have the time to do, and we're going to dive into them in a little more detail. And, 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 and try to see if we can gain some understanding, all of us. First one, repetitive, loveless, cheap sex, or in some translations they say sexual immorality. Now I look at something, you say something cheap, that means it don't have no value, that means it don't, it don't hold no weight, it's something you can just get it anytime, anywhere, any way you want it. For some people that have been bought with a price, it don't seem like that would line up for the people of God. And when you involve yourself in these activities, a lot of times it's a lack of self-esteem. Um, it could be some trauma that has taken place. Um, it's some brokenness. It's some scars there. It's some things that only God can really fix. So in, in, in these situations, like I said earlier, it would make sense for us, instead of diving into these things, putting ourselves at risk of all these different 
uh, hindrances just to seek God wholeheartedly. Some people are diving in pornography and different things. And these things may seem like they're harmless, but they're really self-destructing. You diving into these things, it's tanning your appetite. It's married people doing this stuff. Married people, single people, diving into these activities. And, and what it's doing is it's tanning the way you view people. Men don't look at women as women anymore. They start looking at women as objects. Women, they watch it as well. They start looking at men as objects or things to accomplish the things they want them to accomplish more so than people. It, it prohibits you from seeing things through the right light. So if I'm going out here and I'm not view, even viewing God's people in the right light, I'm already starting off on the wrong foot. When I look at you as a means to an end to get my satisfaction that I need, I need you to scratch that itch I need you to scratch at this moment. I'm not looking at you in the right light. And my mind is warped in this moment. I'm not really seeing things the way I need to see it. It says repetitive. That means you just keep going back, you keep going back, you keep going back. But it also said it's loveless. What you're doing is the old adage, you're looking for love in all the wrong places. You're going back, thinking, if I keep doing this, I keep doing this, I'm going to feel better, I'm going to feel better. And, and it's not about how you feel. It's not about what you think. What is the will of God telling you to do? And I know I say that right now, you're like, man, it's hard when you're in that moment. I get it. I know it's hard. Especially if we're not communing with God on a daily basis. And we come in here Wednesday sometimes and come in on Sunday, and that's the only time we're talking to God. You're still drinking meat. But when you come into a position where you want to grow in God, you want to be more passionate about God, and you start developing to that meat, you start developing to that state, then these things are like, okay, I know these are challenging, but I got God with me. And if he's asking me to do it, he's not asking me to do it by myself. He's going to give me the aid of the Holy Spirit to help me do these things. The next one. A stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. What are we taking in every day? What are the things that's on your mind? I could be honest. Sometimes we, we could be having prayer. Sometimes I my, bow my head to pray, and my mind is just wandering to the most off-the-wall crazy stuff. I'm like, man, we in the middle of prayer. And I'm like, Lord, help me. I can't even keep my mind focused for just two minutes that we have in prayer. I got to look at what am I taking in? What am I watching? What am I listening to on a daily basis? What are these things that I've dealt with in the past? What are these scars and these issues that, that I have that I didn't even know I had? And I was one of those people growing up in a black household, counseling and different things of that nature weren't really popular because they've assumed that you're crazy or something wrong with you. But that's a lie. <laughs> Sometimes you need to go sit down somewhere with somebody who's certified and know what they're doing and tell them what you got going on in your life and what you're struggling with because... What happened is we had this false persona like everything is okay, like we don't have no issues. And all this stuff just piling up, piling up, piling up. Then one day you just explode and people are like, man, it just came out of nowhere. No, it didn't. It was an accumulation of all this stuff that may have happened ever since you were a child that you never addressed. It's causing you mental garbage and it's also causing you to have emotional garbage. You don't even know how to love people. You don't even know what love looked like. Somebody could love you, you couldn't even tell. And you don't even know how to give love back because you don't even know what it feels like to experience that. Because we're scarred. We have our defenses up. We don't, we don't make ourselves vulnerable, which you shouldn't make yourself vulnerable to everybody anyway. But we don't even know how to begin to do that in a way we need to function in in church. If we come in here every day and everybody's an individual, everybody's separated, nobody wants to tap in and build relationships, you're really defeating the purpose of coming in here. If you're going to look at somebody and what they did in the past and, and, and what you call their dirt and all this kind of stuff, but somehow make it seem like their dirt is bigger than the dirt that you did, then you don't need to be here in the first place. It's defeating the purpose. Everybody in here has something they're not proud of that they done done. Everybody in here still have stuff they're not proud of that they got going on in here. So if you can come in this place with a level of arrogance and pride as if you've arrived and you just got it where you just snooty and looking down on anybody, <laughs> you're definitely in bad shape, and that's a sign of immaturity. Next, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness. What are you pursuing to give yourself joy? What are you pursuing? What do you think your happiness is going to be found in outside of the will of God? Let's go back. We're talking about the sexual immorality. We talk about your vain goals and, and, and pleasure. Sometimes we, it's good to have dreams. I'm not telling you not to have dreams. But when your, when your dreams don't line up with the will of God and you keep trying to force that thing to happen, you're not going to have peace of mind because God is in control. You can pursue it all you want. You can go to school for it. You can pay a whole bunch of money, get student loans, get a degree, do, get all these certifications. But if it's not in the will of God, guess what's going to happen? You're not going to have no peace while you're doing it. 
And I'm not being over the top saying, oh, man, don't go to college, go to college, get your education, all that kind of stuff. But what I'm talking about, if you hear God clear as day saying, hey, I want you to go over here and do this, and you decide to go over here and do this, and you're wondering why you're unhappy, you're not going to be happy till you get over here and do what he told you to do. What are you pursuing? It said joyless grabs for happiness. You just keep grabbing. I think it was in Haggai, he talked about you keep filling your bucket up, but your bucket can't be filled because it got holes in it. And what they talked about in that book was, you sit here building your own comfortable houses while the house of God lies in ruins. I remember back in the day, I used to talk to my grandmother. She used to tell me, like, the community was based around the church. The church was the pillar of the community. And all the needs, all the issues they had, they would come together at the church. They would meet, and people within the church would help one another and see what we can do. Now the church is not the pillar. The church is the last resort. We do, we do whatever we want to do. Then we come to church and want them to throw out the raft and rescue us when we about to drown. And when they don't do it, when we come in, now the church don't got no love in it. If we were plugged in, like my sister said a couple of weeks ago, We'll be tapped in. We'll have community. Then we'll have love. We'll have the fellowship. we have everything that you're looking for. But you can't go out here, do what you want to do, how you want to do it, then come back and put people on trial because they don't just move to your beck and call. That ain't, that ain't, that ain't, that ain't real. Trinket or fake gods, pretty much idolatry. When people say idolatry, the first thing they think about is a, a graven image or a statue or uh, a fake god or I'm a different religion or whatnot. You ain't got to go that far. If, I'm, if I get up on Sunday, I'm more excited about football than I am about the Word of God. That's an idol. I'm more excited about what I'm going to eat at the church than I am about the Word of God. That's an idol. If I can spend my money on these shoes before I pay tithes to the church, that's an idol. Whatever it is you're putting before the things of God, that's an idol. And, man, I know some of this stuff, man, this sounds so extreme. I know this is like, man, he tripping up there. I can't even buy no shoes. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that you got to go in and just live in this little bubble in this cave. Don't look at TV. You sit in the dark and just drink water dripping from the ceiling. I ain't saying, I ain't saying you got to do all that. But what I'm trying to show is how far we are off from the will of God. Like, a lot of the things that we're asking, a lot of things that we're seeking are hearing the will of God, but we're just not living that way. It's like we have a subpar relationship with God. And we're trying to figure out why things are not going right. We look at these scriptures. We look at somebody like Paul. Paul wasn't deity. Paul was a great man of God, but he wasn't in the Trinity. He wasn't the father, the son, or the spirit. He was a regular man who was a murderer who was turned around by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he followed God, and he was tapped in. The things that Paul is doing, we're fully capable of doing those same things. But why are we not doing it? Because we got too much stuff in the way. We're not able to see God clearly because we got too many idols. We've got so many false gods, so many things are taking precedence over God. If we move these things out the way, we can see God clearly. Some of us, we're smoking weed when we get stressed out. Some of us, we dive in, we want to drink. Some of us are having the cheap sex he's talking about when we get stressed out. None of these things have value, but yet you subject yourself to these things and destroy yourself on top of the issue that you're already dealing with. And God is saying, all you got to do is mature, have a little obedience, and trust me. But what does a kid do? He throw a tantrum. I don't want to hear no. I can't, I, can't, I can't take hearing the word no. If you don't know how to accept no, you're going to have a long life. Magic show religion. I don't want to come to church unless the prophet going to show up and give me a word. If the prophet don't show up, I don't want to be there. If, if the pastor is having a, a day when he's getting a word of knowledge from God, he speaks to somebody else, but he doesn't speak to me. I'm going to feel some kind of way. The pastor is hearing from God. We have direct access through Jesus to God. If you want to hear something about you, go to God. You don't need the prophet to come up here and just call you out. Do you want a word from God or do you just want to be seen? It's an, it's an adulterous generation that's going to look for signs and wonders. We don't need signs and wonders. We got the word of God. This is the living, breathing embodiment of who God is. Let's check out this next one. Paranoid loneliness. This is that feeling of nobody knows what I'm going through. Nobody understands. Nobody cares. Now, I'm going to be real. It's some people who don't care. It's some people who are rude, and that's one of the problems. We'll get to that later on, but it's some people who don't care. But everyone is not like that. It's somebody who cares. 
And sometimes it could be hard to navigate through that. Sometimes we have trust issues. Sometimes we have challenges from things that we've been through. People have done us wrong. They have mistreated us. So sometimes it's hard to just love again. It's hard to trust again. It's hard to embrace these things. But you got to go to God and say, God, I need you to surround me with some people who I can depend on and who I can trust. Because trying to go through this life alone is impossible. I can't thank some of y'all enough for the way you come and counsel me and talk to me and help me out when I was going through some of my lowest moments. Had I not had that, man, knowing me, ain't no telling what I would have done. I could have been in some crazy situation that uh, it probably would have been hard to get out of. But God and his providence said, you know what? Let me let you talk to this brother right here because you think you're the only one going through that? Let me share something with you real quick. And low self-esteem can also be pride because you're still thinking about yourself and you're still feeling like, man, God forgot about me. He said he's not going to leave you or forsake you. So at the very least, you're going to have him unless you think God is a liar. If you think God is lying, then we got a whole nother, <laughs> whole nother situation that we're dealing with. But on the flip side of that, we have to be people of God that don't make other people feel like they're alone. Nobody should ever be in a church and feel like they're alone. They should never feel like I can't talk to nobody. They should never feel like nobody cares about me. If you feel like nobody cares about you, you feel like you can't talk to nobody, there ain't no church. I don't know what's going on. Y'all just coming together, meeting, saying it's a church. I think with the book of Malachi, I think they had church for several hundred years, and God didn't show up one time. And what that show you is, if God if they're having church and God ain't there, you could just start going through the motions thinking you're having church. And I don't want to be one of those people who just going through the motions thinking I'm having church. I wanted, I wanted to be real. I wanted to be authentic. Because if I say I'm dedicating my life to this, I ain't really come to play around. I want to be serious about it. Cutthroat competition. Wow. That kind of self-explanatory. You willing to do any and everything you can to outdo the other person. You willing to do any and everything you can to be seen. You're willing to knock somebody else down to make yourself look good. And this is in the body of Christ people do this. We, instead of coming together as a unit, fellowship, and esteeming others higher than ourselves, we want to knock somebody else down to make ourselves look good. It angers us when we see other people being successful. We don't celebrate their success. We're looking at what they do so special. Why is it that Why is it that they get all this and that? Why everybody care about what they're doing? If you were in the spot where God was blessing you, you want people to celebrate your success, be happy for you. And maybe your time will be coming, but until you change your heart, God's not going to give you something you can't handle. He's not going to give you the steak if you can't handle it. When you acting like this, that means you got a mouthful of gums. <laughs> and you ain't got no dentures. You're going to choke out. If you can't see other people happy, you're going to choke out. <laughs> Plain and simple. If I can't esteem others higher than myself, you're going to choke. When they have open trials for the Falcons, you're going to fit right on in. Just, just go on down there and sign up. Go on down there and sign up. <laughs> and you're going to feel right at home. <laughs> All consuming yet never satisfied wants. This means we'll just consume with something. We'll give it all our energy, all our effort. For this one thing, we didn't stop and say, God, is this the will for my life? God, do you want me to do this? God, should I go here? Should I go there? That ain't even matter. We saw it, I see it, and I want it. We consumed by it, and we're willing to do whatever we got to do. Let's go back to cutthroat competition. We joyless and friendly, frenzy grabs for happiness. Whatever it is I have to do to get this, it consumes who I am. Never mind God died, Jesus died for you. You're not consumed with the spirit. You're consumed by this thing, this thing that you want. And then, you, and then when you finally get it, what happens in these situations? It still don't satisfy you. You know why? Because you're operating in the flesh, and the flesh is never satisfied. A brutal temper. Just fly off the handle to cuss everybody out. Sooner things don't go your way. You're hollering, you're screaming, you're mad, you're frustrated, you're angry. Everything is everybody else's fault. No self-accountability taking place. You just mad. You just angry. And being somebody who came from from a mindset like, and, I, and the other day I got mad. I got real mad. Chanel was like, I can tell you mad because you don't know 
you know. <laughs> you don't know the mood like this. And then I got convicted. And that was the time when God was like, man, you need to grow up. <laughs> he said, you need to tighten up. Because I was at work, man, some stuff was going on. And I was just like, man, these folks, man, the side of me, I really don't even want to reveal. And, <laughs> and God was like, and you a minister, and you going around doing all this stuff, and you can't even control your temper when somebody making you mad. Grow up. Grow up. <laughs> and impotence to be loved or be loved. Pretty much that means, you, like I was saying earlier, you don't even know how to love, and you don't even know how to be loved. And there's it's numerous reasons why that can be. Like I said, some stuff, I understand. You may have had traumatic situations happen to you growing up or in life. Um, you may have been through tough circumstances. Um, weren't really surrounded by a good crowd of people. Just a lot of negative things have happened to you. So I, I, I get it. But for someone who's professing to be a believer or someone who's in church, even when we go through these low moments, the key is just not to give up. Push through, keep on fighting. Just try your best to find ways to overcome these things. And we feel like through Jesus we have victory over the enemy or through the devil. We should be able to tap into that and seek God wholeheartedly. And sometimes it ain't the devil. We blame the devil for so much stuff. Sometimes people are dealing with disabilities. People are dealing with illnesses. Sometimes people are dealing with all kinds of challenges. So once again, I then flip the challenges with the church. If you see somebody struggling like this, it's our job to show them what love looks like. It's our job to be an example of what love looks like. We should go to this person understanding that they may not respond in a way they may be fitting to you off the bat because they don't know. You got to keep in mind they don't know. I'm not going to go to the baby and say, hey, you need to vacuum this flow. And when I come back in the flowing vacuum, I'm going to get mad. He's a baby. He don't even know how to operate a vacuum. So if I'm dealing with somebody who's not, who not, who not uh, accustomed to love or being love or showing love, I have to be patient. I have to be kind. I have to understand that this person needs this kind of affection so they can know where to go. Because if you're mad at somebody, they don't know what to do. You can go to another job tomorrow, and the first day where they say, just get to work and they ain't tell you what to do. You're going to be fired the first day. Next, divided homes and divided lives. We just start first in the house of God. We can't have a divided house of God and call ourselves mature saints. We can't have divided lives. Now, there's some stuff, let's be careful. Some stuff is personal. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, some stuff need to be in your house. Some stuff, I don't even want to hear about what's going on in your house. But we talk about divided lives. We're talking about in the house of God. <laughs> yeah, we're talking, we're talking about something totally different. What we're talking about <laughs> is no communication, no fellowship, no reaching out, no keeping in touch, no praying for one another. No, no checking on how each other is doing. We just totally divided. We come here as individuals. We leave as individuals. No community, no holy community, no fellowship, no love, or nothing. You can't fully expect for us to function in the way we were built to function if we're separated and divided in this way. If you want to bring it home in our own homes, if we're divided and we can't come on one accord within our homes, our homes are going to struggle. So if our homes are struggling, you got a whole bunch of broken homes coming into the same place. You got broken homes, you're going to have a broken church. Simply put. So I'm wrapping this up now. Small minded and lopsided pursuits. When I looked at this, man, I was just thinking about how many times we just belittle God, how many times we just strive after things. Um strive after things where we just limited ourselves and we limited God. Sometimes we limit God to our personal perspective. Sometimes we don't see God doing things past what I can see God doing. If I can't see God doing this or doing that, he can't do it. So I begin to chase these things over here, not giving God a chance to show me and open my eyes. It's that immature state I was talking about earlier. You don't seek wisdom because you feel like you've already obtained it. You got to realize that his ways are not our ways. His, his, he's sitting up here. He can look down and see us. But I don't care how high you look up in the sky, you're not going to be able to see God. So he has a view over things that we don't have. So at this time, we have to adopt his views and his principles over our own unless you think you're God, which is idolatry, and the fruit of idolatry is going to be very unsuccessful. Uncontrolled or uncontrollable addictions. Addictions, I was reading something that says, for a Christian, addictions come when they feel like God is not enough. You start diving into these things, 
And it seemed like little simple habits at first. You may start off, I'm a social drinker. Oh, I just smoke when I go out. Oh, I just dab, dibble and dab in this, you know what I'm saying? I just might do this here and there. Next thing you know, you find in more situations where you feel more comfortable diving into these things. Not the thing you thought you had a hold of, now it has a hold of you. And when you can become addicted to something, now it's, it's a real battle, it's a real fight. Some addictions can take over your life. I was talking about earlier, people battling with pornography, people dealing with alcoholism, people are, and, and diving into all this self-destructive stuff, and your flesh is just saying, I need it, I need it, I need it. But you're not equipping your spirit to fight against that. Like I said last time, if you got a dog over here and a dog over here, and you're going to do a, a dog fight, which I don't recommend if Peter is watching, if you got, you got a dog over here and a dog over here, whatever dog you feeding the most is the dog that's going to win. So if you feeding your, your, your flesh more, you feeding your spirit, the spirit is going to be the one that's going to win. So that's another reason why we have to dive into this word of God, into these spiritual things, because it's a spiritual battle. Our, our, our adversary is not physical. It's a spiritual fight that we're going through right now. It's a battle that's physical, not, not physical, but spiritual. So you could do all, lift all the weights you want. You could do all these things you want to do. But the devil's still going to weigh you out if you're not sitting back, reading your word of God, praying and tapping into the things that God wants us to do. And that's where these addictions come from, when our defenses are weakened. And we just dive into stuff looking for that instant gratification. And the devil's a coward. He's not going to come to you when you feel like you're strong and when you're on top of your game. He'll come to you when you feel like you're vulnerable and when you're weak. You look at Jesus when he fasted for those 40 days. He didn't come day one trying to tempt him with all this stuff. He came after the 40th day when he knew he was hungry and he was tired. And offered him all these things that it seemed like in that moment would give him satisfaction. But what did he do? He leaned on the word of God and he knew what the truth was. And that's what he did in those times instead of just diving in, pleading his flesh. Ugly parodies of community. Fake community. That's like I said earlier, coming in here, acting like we have in church, but we're not. Acting like you care about other people when you really don't. Asking folks, how you doing while you're on the way out the door? If I'm asking you, let me, how you doing, man? Do I look, I care about what you're doing when I'm walking over here like this? <laughs> yeah, man, hold on right there, man. I'll be right back. And I'm going to wait till the car unlock the door. You're not going to go back. I'm going to pray for you. As soon as you get in the car, you forgot about it. That's why I made a habit now. If I said I'm going to pray for you, I'm going to pray for you on the spot. Because we had a famous quote to say, I'm going to pray for you. And then as soon as we, forget, as soon as we leave their presence, you know, we're thinking about praying for them folks most of the time. You think about whatever you got going on. And he said, I could go on. But what you see here, if you break this down, all these different things, how many people in here can see? You got to raise your hand. Don't even do it. But how many people in here can see themselves in some of this activity? Probably most of us. And these are some of the reasons why we feel the way we feel them. Not all the reasons, because like I said, stuff do happen in life, and I understand that. But a lot of this stuff is self-inflicted. A lot of this stuff that we're going through is because we haven't chosen to put God first, and we're operating in the flesh. We're immature. Now, it says, to those who are new in the faith, it's understandable they may struggle with basic principles of Christianity. But for seasoned believers, it's too late in the game for elementary principles. Like I said earlier, these elementary principles should be in our heart already as the foundation that we're building on. When you get to the Super Bowl, it's not the time to forget the playbook. <laughs> it's not the time to forget the playbook. Also, knowledge puffs us up. Don't ever get so comfortable that you think you got it all together. The basis should remain in our hearts as our foundation, but the foundation isn't the ceiling. It's the place that we build on. So when you feel like you reached the ceiling, when you feel like you can't go no further, you're in a, you're in a very dangerous position because it's a long way down. Pride comes before the fall. And, and this is simple stuff that we've heard before, but yet it's so easy to fall into it because we have an adversary who's been doing this for thousands of years. And the moments that you want to take off and think you can relax, he's not taking those moments off. He's plotting on you. So next, real quick, I'm just going to read what spiritual maturity looks like, and then I'll be out your way. We're going to look at verses in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. We got to see the value of the things of God. And like I said earlier, too, sometimes we might wrestle with knowing where we end and where God begins. But the wise person at least knows the place where we end and where God begins. The person who is immature, they don't, they don't understand that. They try to be God. And then they end up disappointed and they end up feeling a lot of the emotions that a lot of us are feeling right now. Because in our mind, we're not telling ourselves, man, I'm trying to be God. I ain't got to listen to God. But we're not really showing that trust in it. We're trying to handle everything on our own. We have good intentions, but 
it's still not working out for us because we can't do what God can do. So we're going to start at verse 22. But what happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives, much the same way that fruit appears in the orchard, things like affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart, and a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. Legalism is helpless in bringing this about. It only gets in the way. Among those who belong to Christ, everything connected with getting our own way and mindlessly responding to what everyone else calls necessity is killed off for good, is crucified. So basically what it's saying, all the things you want to do for yourself, trying to live on your own way, we got to die to that. We got to crucify that. Amen. And the things that they say come by living by the Spirit, these are the things that all of us are looking for. We're looking for that excitement, that exuberance about life. We're looking for peace or that serenity, a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart, a conviction that basic holiness permeates things and people, thinking all good things about people, hoping the best for people. These are the things that we should and want to do. And it's as simple as that. Follow the spirit. But if you don't know how the spirit operates, you're going to be lost. And that's where a lot of us are. And in certain aspects of our lives, we're lost right now because we're not fully tapped in to what the spirit of God is doing. And instead of having that relationship with God, God is almost like a stranger to us because we only spend Wednesdays, sometimes, and Sundays with him. When you got five other days during the week. So imagine if you flip that around. Imagine if you spent those five days with God and two days doing with other, whatever else you, you were doing. We'll see a drastic change in our lives and our relationship with God. So my encouragement, man, is let's just stop playing. Let's just grow up. Let's mature in the things of God. And sometimes, man, I know y'all come in here and y'all tired of hearing some of this stuff. You're like, man, here we go again. But when you're in school, only time you got to repeat a class is when you ain't passed it the first time. So maybe God wants to do some stuff with us, but we got to get past certain classes first so we can go to the next level. I'm not going to stick somebody from kindergarten and put them in a 12th grade class the following year. They got to learn. They got to grow. So let's not be so haughty and so proud for the thing we don't have to grow. Amen? Amen. If it's anybody in here who feels like, you know what, man, my relationship with God, I've been kind of stagnant. You know, I've been, I've been doing a lot of self-pleasing. I've been doing a lot of things for me instead of God. I've been doing a lot of things for me instead of other people. Or you may just feel exhausted. You may feel like, man, I don't even have the energy to do the things that God wants me to do. I don't even know where to start. I don't even know how to go about doing these things. Or you see yourself in these scriptures and you just want to repent and say, God, forgive me. And just show me how to have a, a fresh start and, and apply these things in my life and to my heart and to my mind so I could be a better person. If any of you feel this way, I'll be more than happy to pray for you. You can come down. If you feel comfortable, you can just raise your hand or stay where you are. But it's too late in the game, man. There's too many people out here who are questioning what we believe.